Well, all our speakers are here, so I will uh, open this uh, uh, session of our um, Socialists of America Summer School. My name is Ben. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we have three wonderful, three plus wonderful speakers tonight speaking on the history of the 1970s and socialist feminism. But before we start, I did want to say just a brief word about why we're here, why we do uh, political education. Um, and I would say, this is my own opinion, but there are two reasons, two good reasons. The first is because the world is scary and we want to change that. And small as this room is, uh, there are people here who are working to change that. And we want to don't want to start from scratch. This is a education series on the history of people like us, Americans who identify as socialists who are working to change the world. And we want to learn from their successes so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and also learn from their mistakes and failures so that we don't repeat. That's the first reason. And the second reason is because it's important to me personally, and I think important to a lot of people here to build some kind of socialist culture. Our civilization we live in, the capitalist society we live in is very alienating. And it's nice to know that there's a place on a pleasant midsummer um, Tuesday to come and meet with other people who have some of the same questions you are. May not have the same answer to them, might have disagreements, uh, uh, but it's a place where we can be together and kind of build a common project together. I want to say a word about that, which is that means that we value comradely debate here. And I want to stress the comradely part that we don't want to tolerate toxic behavior. We want people to, to hear each other and argue in good faith with each other. Um, but we also value questions. You know, people are free to have disagreements here. We actually want to prioritize them. As a matter of fact, I would say think. Of a, try to think of a question before you think of a statement. As in, if you, it is very valuable to me to set a tone that, you know, we don't have all the answers. And if you have a question, however basic or simple, probably someone else has it and get it out in the open. Let's, 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 let's talk about it there. I think that's really, really important. So that having been said, I wanna, we have a packed session, so I wanna get started. We have three speakers, Carly, uh, Alice, and Ashley. We're all members of our poly ed committee, and we have um, a uh, also because this is such a rich subject. We will have a um, Alice has uh, recorded a um, conversation with an important historian, Felicia Cornblue, that we'll see excerpts from an edited version of a longer thing. Uh, so, this just to give you a picture in your head before we start um, the conversation. Uh, uh, We'll pause in the middle of the conversation at certain points to, to have some discussions, to get some, some uh, to begin a conversation. Um, so uh, if you find yourself, uh, so to, to get those questions ready as we're going. Don't say, you don't have to save them up all for the end. Um, with that said, I welcome our speakers up to the stage. So tonight we have lots to cover. Thank you all for joining us. It's so nice to see so many new faces and people who have come to many of our sessions throughout the spring. Um, so the history of the 1970s and socialist feminism is expansive and huge. We are going to give you some brief historical context. We're going to talk about how socialist feminism differs from liberal feminism. We're going to talk a little bit about political theory and the role and where women are located in the political theory canon. Um, I'm a political theorist and I have the floor. Um, and then we're going to look at two case studies. We're going to look at reproductive justice and working women and labor reforms in the 1970s. Uh, and through both of those, we'll tease out some of the historical context and theory that we discussed at the top. And then we will close with a little discussion. Um, as Ben mentioned, uh, we 
We've also recorded an interview with a historian who's in Germany, so she couldn't join us live, but we're trying to bring her in as much as possible. So you'll see some clips from that interview interspersed. Um, but yeah, we really encourage active debate and conversation. And I think we also, the three of us want to say up front, we've learned a lot preparing for this session, but we also don't know everything about this subject. So if there are things you want to bring up, other examples, questions you have that we're all here to teach and learn from one another. So please see and hold that. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to pass it to Ashley to tell us a little bit about the project. Thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, so everyone, welcome to this conversation about socialist feminism and labor organizing in the 1970s. Um, throughout the tonight's session, we want to provide context for everyone to have a general understanding of the world that women are stepping into by the 1970s. Um, it's important to first consider a snapshot of what feminism had been up to this point, a general idea of what distinguishes socialist feminism from liberal feminists, and even radical feminists at the time. Um, so I'll start with that. Ashley, uh, can I ask you just to speak up a little bit sort of back on the Zoom? Like, oh, really? Oh my God, I've never been asked to speak louder in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Sure. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, while women had previously taken a larger role in the workforce during wartime production and for World War II, by the 1950s, there's a shift back to the suffocating imagery of domestic life. Um, as a woman's proper role in society. And part of this is propaganda during the Cold War, um, during the Second Red, Red Scare. Cold War propaganda romanticizes the image of the American family while highlighting the evils of communism. So this is happening at the same time. Second wave feminism takes place throughout the 1960s and 70s. Up to this point, women have fought for the right for everything from legal autonomy and individual personhood within marriage, for not only the right to vote, own property, and receive higher education, but also for legal protection from things like marital rape and domestic abuse. The previous women's suffrage movement was also notoriously centered on white and upper class women. And in the 1950s, the 1970s, the 1970s, we see a shift toward more inclusion and intersectionality, largely driven by radical and socialist feminists. In general, many feminist activists by this point have also been involved in other movements, like the civil rights movement, gay liberation, and others. So second wave feminism in the 60s and 70s is largely characterized by a deeper analysis of gender roles and domestic or reproductive labor, reproductive autonomy, and challenging concepts of male supremacy in society, which is identified as patriarchy or patriarchal system. The FDA by this time has approved the contraceptive pill in 1960, giving women more control over their reproductive rights, when within five years, around six million women are using it. And this dramatically reshapes what's even possible in women's life to not be trapped to your uterus. Um, as doors of opportunity are reluctantly open, women in the 70s are also challenging treatment within these contexts. So access to employment is not enough. Which positions are women allowed to hold? And why are women objectified through workplace sexual harassment? Minimal access to education isn't enough. Where is sex-based discrimination still widespread? And how do we organize to achieve legal protection for our right to fully participate? These are the questions, among many others, that are the fuel for feminist organizing in the 1970s. Any questions? I feel like I should pause. <laughs> We're reading a lot. Um, okay. Yeah, what was first made? I'm sorry? Uh, what was the first wave? The first wave? Uh, so we didn't, I'm not, so I glazed over the first wave here, talking about women's suffrage, the right to vote, the right to own property. It was most known for the right to vote. There were other like fights for that. And then just saying by the second wave, we're trying to get deeper into equity, people of color being represented in not just white upper class women, getting more into workplace harassment, this kind of an abortion as well known Roe v. Wade, this kind of thing. Um, good question though, because it's like to divide all the waves up, it's like, it's such a good guy. Um, okay, uh, socialist feminists sought to deepen this conversation by expanding awareness of women, um, women's economic disadvantage. So women are not just disadvantaged by sexism and patriarchy, so socialist feminists introduced capitalism and economic uh, exploitation as just as influential in women's lives. So to be reliant on men economically makes a huge difference on women's lives. Um, this is distinct from liberal feminists who don't seek to challenge the economic structure that will continue to exploit women, to condemn women to poor life outcomes and the trauma and trauma due to their economic constraints, or even to continue necessary reliance on men for survival. 
So this will happen. We'll see this unfold, unfold through uh, after the seven days, um, following uh, and worsen in some ways, regardless of the important victories that we're going to talk about in the session today, and that we're going to do secure in the second wave. Liberal feminism was significant to the movement, but it has inherent limitations on the extent of true women's liberation possible because of a lack of a, prop, of a priority on class-based exploitation. However, socialist feminism was also distinct from radical feminist thought at the time. I just kind of touched on this, which places the primary burden of women's oppression on patriarchy. So we all familiar with like, the conversation about patriarchy and sex-based discrimination um, in terms of male supremacy. Socialist feminist, um, sorry. Socialist feminists called for consideration of the multiple intersections that affect women's lives, both sex discrimination and class oppression, as well as race and other planes of discrimination. This was the distinctive mark of socialist feminism. And finally, socialist feminists were also distinct from previous Marxist feminist movements, which I thought was interesting to note, that placed a priority on class um, analysis and this orthodox faith that Marxism can explain all forms of domination, including male domination. They also didn't agree with that. So they're adding in the, the patriarchy, the other analysis that they don't feel is explicitly covered in Marxism on its own. So expanding that conversation to more accurately address the issues that women face. Um, I think we have a quote coming up if you want to. <laughs> um, I'll end my inter. Yes. Okay. I'll end my introduction here with a quote from the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. There is a fundamental interconnection between women's struggle and what is traditionally conceived as class struggle. Not all women's struggles have an inherently anti-capitalist direction, but all those which build collectivity and collective confidence among women are vitally important to the building of class consciousness. Conversely, not all class struggles have an inherently anti-sexist dress, especially not those that cling to pre-industrial patriarchal values. I feel like they're throwing shade there a little bit. So, um, but all those which seek to build the social and cultural autonomy of the working class are necessarily linked to the struggle for women's liberation. Great, so I'm gonna pass it on to Carly. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right, yeah, so um, actually touched upon a lot of the abstract like uh, concepts of the time, as well as our like material context. I'm going to give some more specific facts on um, how organizing grew in that time. And excuse me for just reading off this paper. Um, it's important to understand that much of the activity and growth of feminism in this time comes from the lessons that women learn as part of the new left, the anti-war movement and anti-racist organizing. In these movements, women directly learned organizing skills and political theory. Women of the time were able to apply these new ways of thinking and skills to their own personal lives and to the world around them, recognizing a larger need for feminist organizing. Um, however, and unfortunately, the first thing many women uh, ended up reflecting on and talking about was their own role in the movements that they participated in. Um, too often, women were treated by men in these left movements as secretaries or sex objects or otherwise disrespected, disregarded um, for these male revolutionaries, or from these male revolutionaries. So even in these anti-capitalist and anti-racist organizations, women were able to get together and discuss in their own um, small caucuses and discussion groups within these movements to reflect on what they were experiencing. Um, they were able to draw on both Marxist theory, the things that they've learned in these movements, and their own material experiences to develop a new feminism that addressed the exploitation of women's labor at work, at home, and in the movement. Um, many of these early feminist groups adopted a practice of consciousness raising. So um, a term that you all can hear in social feminist, radical feminist cases is like consciousness raising groups. Um, drawing on organizing tactics that were used and learned in the civil rights movement, women would hold meetings where they would speak openly about their lives, truly just what they're dealing with throughout the day. Um, and together, through that collective discussion and dialogue, be able to began to form a shared analysis connecting these issues that many women previously thought were their own personal problems to political conditions of women's oppression. 
Um, so this is sort of where that phrase, the personal is political, comes from, this idea of, of observing how the systemic relations affect your interpersonal relationships. Um, women's liberation groups then began to spring up around the country. So these groups had varying degrees of connections to the institutions of the left and Marxism itself, um, largely radical feminists, but set a, uh, I guess, ideology section that Ashley mentioned, um, saw sex as the fundamental class distinction in society, um, but also understood that economic equality was crucial, is crucial to women's liberation, and understood the exploitation of reproductive labor to be a foundational part of women's oppression. So this concept of seeing um, the reproductive labor aspect of the women's sex class um, was a pretty emblematic uh, theory for the group. Um, we're going to touch more on the concept of reproductive labor in a bit with Alice. Um, let's see. They employed a variety of tactics rather than this um, to fight for social democratic rights like abortion, child care, social welfare, and access to education and employment. Um, another big thing of the second wave were these uh, cultural reflections. So additionally, um, discussions and debate around the concept of overturning beauty standards and ending violence and exploitation. Um, there was also an emphasis on creating and reclaiming women's culture in line with the broader countercultural trends of the time, which is fun. Um, I don't know, burn your bra. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this was a time of constant debate, discussion, development of new ideas, and thus much conflict, much contradiction between different um, groups of thought. So throughout this whole talk, we're going to say radical feminists here, socialist feminists here, liberal feminists here. Um, however, one of the most famous women's liberation groups that does have some socialist roots is the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Um, this was founded at a conference in 1969, nice by women who wanted to turn their discussion groups into a movement built on solidarity and self-interest as women. So their mission statement says, point blank, if they don't have on a slide, sorry. Um, changing women's position in society isn't going to be easy. It's going to require changes in expectations, jobs, childcare, and education. It's going to change the distribution of power over the rest of us um, to all people sharing power and sharing in the decisions that affect our lives. So the CWLU um, is widely considered to be the first organization to use the term socialist feminism. Um, they released a pamphlet in 1972, Socialist Feminism, a Strategy for the Women's Movement. Um, it was the Hyde Park chapter. Uh, oh. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my hometown. So it began with the idea, of, and I'm quoting here again, as socialist feminists, we share both the personal and the structural we see a combination of the two as essential if we're going to become lasting And this is exactly what Ashley was saying about social feminism. The idea of understanding the core oppression of patriarchy and sex based oppression mixed with um, a class analysis, a historical material analysis. So to the CW, CLW, not CWLU, sorry. <laughs> um, like many groups of the time, all of these areas were connected and could be explained and addressed by socialist feminism. Unfortunately, also like many groups of the time, uh, they failed to cohere into a lasting mass organization because of their commitment to rejecting higher fees. It prevented them from creating more centralized democratic structures. Um, I'm sure this is a thing that can be contested. Still, the legacy of groups of like the CW, CWLU is still held today, and we have much to learn from their success. And I think we are going to go from this concept of organizations and movements into, um, or sort of step, take a step back into some more core theory, and then. All right, so now we're going to turn the clock way back. 
Who are these guys? Shout them out. Who do you see? Is that angles in the bottom right corner? Aristotle. Yeah, Who's that? Aristotle. Yeah. Aristotle. Yeah. Aristotle. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And what do they all have in common? Yes, sir. White man. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we're gonna start with Aristotle because why not? Um, we often in political theory we start with what is the fundamental unit of politics. How do we exist in community? How do we exist in politics? What are the implications of that for the project of liberation and understanding inequality? So Aristotle starts us off. He, he contends the first human relationships form between man and wife and man and ox. Um, and with those two relationships, you're set. Um, you now have a family and you can plow the land and you can have a marriage. And then from that, you can enter into politics. So that is page one of his politics. Um, if we look at Hegel, um, in philosophy of right, he starts with agriculture and marriage as the beginning of politics. Agriculture, again, reduces the ability to be nomadic and for people to roam freely. And marriage, he writes, restricts sex to a contractual relationship. So we get these tiny morsels of where women are located in the history of political theory in their you know, opening line about how the first unit of politics is made. What does this mean for women? What now, thousands of years later, we have this robust canon of political thought. This is how much of political theory is still thought and um, how we analyze our world today. But where are the women um, is the question. And what, if anything, does political theory have to offer women? Next slide, please. So here's some pictures I gathered, what of women's role um, as these theorists have um, mentioned. So we, we see women as mother, we see this a picture of Republican motherhood, um, women as educators, women as caretakers, and this concept of reproductive labor starts to emerge as we think about women's role and start to really tease it out of or patriarchal capitalist political theory. Um, would someone mind reading this quote uh, yeah. about what we consider reproductive labor to be? Reproductive labor is like electricity, visible yet everywhere, and it powers everything. Much of the negotiation of daily life involves deciding either to give your time and energy to performing reproductive labor or outsourcing it to someone else. It is unrecognized, uncelebrated, often unpaid, and yet utterly necessary. Emily Kalachi. Yeah. Um, but I love this analogy, reproductive labor being like electricity, just like the, the quiet powering of everything. And, and when we think about the, these like elemental, these atomic units of politics, the family, reproductive labor is what keeps that unit together. So what happens when we split the atom? What happens when we break it up? And, the, you know, I got chills. It's like, what happens? And it shows how important reproductive labor is and the role that women are playing in the family. Because without it, the family falls apart, capitalism falls apart, and we're in chaos. So in the project of holding capitalism, controlling women's reproductive labor is paramount. Um, who educates children who has the baby takes care of the baby. This is essential to the work. Um, and maintaining women's position is essential to the function of capitalism and politics as we know. I'm right with that. So next slide, please. So we're just gonna pause here just so we have a little interaction. What else is the blue of society that we often don't think about that is often played by women. 
Healthcare. Healthcare. Cleaning. Education. Education. It's a weird one, but I think a lot of um, passage of culture and religion. Mm -hmm. Emotional, Emotional labor. Mm -hmm. Also, breathing. Breathing, yeah. Um, I feel like the core of reproductive labor is uh, the concept of women as a group, whether it's true for the one or not, and, um, being seen as the group that leads, that owns the means of production for literally the human race. Mm -hmm. So reproductive labor, yeah, or ability. So these are all aspects of reproductive labor, and they're all really important to feminists because they are so controlled and so attacked um, by those maintaining capitalism. Go ahead. Um, I think folks have to fully hear this thing. Um, so yeah, some other things that come to mind when we think about reproductive labor, um, abortion, birth control, sterilization, domestic violence, sexual violence, queerness, sex work, these all become really key features of the feminist agenda because they are that which is most controlled. Um, I'm going to also give us a little theoretical primer from Catherine McKinnon, who is not without controversy, I will say. <laughs> um, she was and is a really prominent theorist in radical feminism, and the piece we assigned for this class is like the 96th most cited law review paper of all time, Marxism, Method, and an Agenda for Feminist Theories. So she's really important, her idea is really important, but she is a controversial, controversial radical feminist um, because she has really hot takes, especially around pornography and sex work. Um, so I'll just pause there. I'm happy to discuss more later, um, but we're gonna talk about how she analyzes um, power and women. Um, I think the first line of the piece we assigned was sexuality is to feminism, what work is to Marxism that which is most one's own yet most taken away um and this is a quote from on difference and domination which is a different essay um uh, somebody mind reading this block quote oh yeah thanks Benton. uh both paragraphs yeah um, gender is also a question of power, specifically for male supremacy and female subordination. The question of equality from the standpoint of what it's going to take to get it is at root a question of hierarchy, which, as power succeeds constructing social perception and social reality, derivatively becomes a categorical perception and social reality. Here on the first day, dominance was achieved, probably by force. By the second day, division along the same lines had to be found in faith. On the third day, if not sooner, differences were demarcated together with social systems to exaggerate them in perception and in fact, because of systematically differential delivery of benefits and deprivations required making no mistake who was who. Comparatively speaking, man has been resting. So I, I love this on the first day, um, on the second day, on the third day, because that is exactly what we see in Aristotle. On the first day, man takes wife, and then on the second day, he is a political being, and he can enter into politics, and then from that, we get political economy. But what happened on that first day? On the first day, domination was achieved, and the notion of gender was constructed, put in place so that that domination could be upheld as man continued to be in the workplace um, and a political being. So this and this theory that I've just given you is where liberal feminism and socialist and Marxist feminism diverges theoretically. Um, also. Liberal feminists must see a coexistence between capitalism and feminism, capitalism and women's liberation. I think of bourgeoisie feminism as lean in, work as hard as men, and you will be liberated, get paid just as much as men, have access to birth control and abortion, 
um, and women will be fine. And radical feminists, often socialists and Marxist feminists, contend that there is a fundamental incompatibility, not just with capitalism and patriarchy, but with or with women's liberation and capitalism. It's women's liberation not being compatible with our current politics, our current existing social world, uh, which is why they're called radical. Yeah. When you say there's a fundamental compatibility, um, I'm not trying to quibble, but isn't it more accurate to say there's um, the dialectical tension, right? I know that's an incredibly wacky term, but like um, surely it's the case that, that like we're talking about need and we're talking about the way in which the needs of the capital come to eliminate the needs of the working class. And so surely it's the case that under capitalism, some of women's needs and some of the working class needs are met. And obviously Mark in chapter 10, right, is talking about how the collective state intervenes to ensure that the, the working class is crushed. So it's not that there's a it's not fundamental. I think we um we um we understate the case for liberalism by calling it fundamental. And, and surely the Marxist position is to say that um we say that uh the, the, the needs of the working class and the reproductive needs are insufficiently met under capitalism, and that's why we contend for a project that exceeds those limits into a class of society in which needs are more fundamentally met. Yeah, and that I think that is what some theorists might take they might equate gender to class and i think in that in that perspective you can make that case and, and theorists do um but there is i think a this is a slightly different stance which is that gender is not we can't think of it as a class in in attention with capitalism it's like well, it's day one, you know, it's it's like 2000, it's like the, the birth of humanity, day, like day one domination was achieved and class tension emerges a lot later than that. Um, so I think that's, that's like a distinction between, it, it, it's applying a Marxist method, but it's not necessarily Marxist, like true, like, I am a, I am Marx, you know, so orthodox Marxism. Does that clarify? And sure. does anyone else have thoughts on that? Please. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, as if, if we are socialist revolutionaries, we're for socialism on our way to a classless society, on our way to communism. So if we posit it just for just for, for the working class to take power, you're right. But if we posit it that we're going all the way to the end and changing everything, which has to be the point of view of socialists, you know, then, then we have to have a thoroughgoing critique of the patriarchy mm -hmm. down to how the family changes in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and especially in a situation where the right wing is upholding the family, we have to have a vision that, you know, goes beyond that, but it, and is appealing, mm -hmm. and is appealing to everyone. So I think that's why what you're talking about is what we have to have. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, last comment that we're going to have. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it also raises interesting questions. I mean, thinking about that history and thinking about today, it's interesting to think what, like, um, the theorists of that time, like, what fundamentally they got right, what, you know, I mean, social theorists are not prophets. And so what's interesting is, I think, like, some more progress for middle class women than theorists of that time seems to have happened than I think they anticipated. Which I think is interesting and should affect how we think about like capitalism and what capitalism can allow. On the other hand, we can also say pretty systematically that the condition for like the working class generally has like been degraded. And so oftentimes it's also like, are we imagining, I mean, what you said about lean and feminism is it's like, are we imagining a liberation that, you know, I don't know, I, Sheryl Sandberg might have a really nice life and that like might have actually like overthrown patriarchal domination in her personal person. Like, I, I don't know, I'm not so qualified to judge, but like the question is, what about the majority and yeah. what about you know, working people? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on.
Yes, so great discussion. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So now, I mean, we're still in the intro, y'all. We got lots to cover. Um, so we're going to locate socialist feminism a little bit within the time period. Um, so we got a great historical framework already, but um, as we covered, it really emerges out of the new left. We talked about the 1960s left Russian. Um, and a lot of these women who are active in the 70s were active in 1955, 1965 student movements. Um, I think it's worth noting as well here that the, the comprehensive history of so-called socialist feminism is quite challenging. Um, and we found that in our research and preparation for this and my conversation with the historian. Um, these groups were, were, were local. They were talking about their own experience and trying to make material gains in their communities. And there was no really cohesive understanding of what is the socialist feminist program. Um, so we're, we're gonna kind of deal with some of those tensions um, in this sector as we go. So, and as we talked about um, in terms of race and class lines, the women's liberation movement was initiated mainly by young white middle class college educated women. Um, we saw a lot of the class and race line replicated from the students in the new left. And there were reasons for it, just like structural privilege, enabling women to um, take up the ideas of feminism and cause divisions with men um, and just take more radical positions. Um, but we also saw separate streams of Black, Latina, Asian, American Indian feminism arise all throughout the country. Um, I just want to highlight one um, because they're really important. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, there's a picture from the National Organization of Women Now. We're going to talk about them a bit later. They were like big tent national organization. They still are. They have local chapters. They fought a lot for the right to abortion but had a lot of issues with socialist feminism um, and with lesbians. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of lesbian division in this movement, we learned. Um, all right, next slide, please. So the Comedy River Collective, um, which emerges in Boston, 1974, 1975, um, produced the most influential statement of Black socialist feminism at the time, and they're widely credited with um, introducing the idea of intersectionality to say, hey, not only do, the, is there feminism, but we as Black feminists, as Black lesbian feminists, face a lot of different intersecting modalities of oppression that need to not be considered separately, but be considered as part of a whole identity and project of liberation. Cool. Um, so the, yeah. Final note, just the uh, historian we assigned to today, Linda Gordon, um, her piece is trying to piece together some of this history. And she said that this, the fractured nature of the movement is by design. And it's, we often think of it as one of its weaknesses, but it's really a strength because it allowed women to really speak from their experiences and they take local action. Um, but it is certainly more challenging to piece together this history. I'm going to pause briefly and then we're going to turn to reproductive labor in politics. Any questions or comments? Okay, onwards. Okay. We are in a perilous moment for reproductive politics in this country. Um, and we have been for a while, and we were before Roe v. Wade, and we are going to work really hard um, in the post-Roe time. And I think that's why it's like so important to really understand this history of how women is organized for the right to abortion and um, organized against coercive sterilization in parallel. Um, and this, as a case study, is really, really illustrates a lot of these themes that we have discussed so far. We're going to talk about the differences between white liberal feminism and the fight for abortion and the fight against coerced sterilization, which was led largely by women of color. Um, so in New York State, where we're going to focus specifically, because we are New York DSA, we are in New York now. You didn't know that. <laughs> That's a problem. But, um, 
Prior to 1970 in New York, abortion was criminalized. Um, and that criminalization happened as the medical profession was gaining formality at, in the turn of the century. And they, they pushed lawmakers to criminalize abortion, which is, was, I mean, women were dying from unsafe abortions, but a lot of the ways that women were terminating pregnancies were through midwives and informal medical help, um, which the, the, the doctor lobbyists wanted to get rid of. So abortion was criminalized in New York, I believe around 1920. Um, and then in the 1960s, there's a lot, this big swell of um, uh, fight for reproductive rights as women are gaining an understanding of their social position. <clears throat> and I'm going to invite a speaker who has been joining us asynchronously, um, and I interviewed her. Um, she wrote a book called A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother or Neighbor and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. I encourage you all to pick it up. Um, she wrote a book about this parallel movement in New York um, and how the abortion fight was led largely by white women um, and Puerto Rican women who are facing forced sterilization. Um, name there, this woman is the head of was that of Lincoln Hospital where the young lords occupied. Um, so they will feature in this story as well. Um, okay, let's go to the clips. So um so thank you so much, Alicia. So Thank you so much, Alicia. Okay, so we also want to keep this as engaging as possible. Um, I know it's not ideal that we have a recording of this professor. Um, so please also feel free to interject and I will do my best to answer questions um, and keep the discussion going. But we're gonna now pause the video. So thank you so much, Alicia, for joining us. The volume a little bit. Um, so we was written a really good story about abortion and forced sterilization in New York City and New York State. Um, and I would just love if you could first give a little overview of the story, how you came to it, um, some of the key actors, uh, and just kind of give us a first eye view of your and research. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I this is my third book, and I wrote two prior books um, about the welfare rights movement and about social welfare policy. Um, and I've been doing that kind of work for a long time um, as an advocate. Operate a bit on the involved. Operate a bit on the involvement of the young lord. I think it's all of us operate a bit on the operate a bit on the involvement. They're too quiet. I wonder if it's a max on the YouTube itself. Like, yeah, maybe just yeah, it, it, it is. Um, I think it's just it. coming out with a lot of similar yes. Yes. Uh, So, no reason really a little bit. Um, I wrote two papers um, about uh, the welfare rights movement and about social welfare policy. Um, and I've been doing that kind of work for a long time um, as an advocate or activist, and also as a as a researcher and a teacher. It's okay. okay. Can people hear it? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much. Are there still captions? I, I wrote two no, probably not. Yeah, no. um, about the the welfare rights movement and about social welfare policy. Um, and I've been doing that kind of work for a long time um, as an advocate or activist and also as a as a researcher and a teacher. Um, and one of the one of the conversations that I started having when I was talking about my my last book, which was about Bill Clinton's welfare reform. Was about how how welfare itself is um, an instrument of reproductive justice, right? And I found that for women's history people and um, women's studies people, it was actually very hard for them to understand 
Um, and one of the you know, interesting opportunities with this book was that I was looking at it from the other side of the coin, you know, starting with reproduction and something that maybe a lot of people think they understand the politics of reproduction around abortion rights or access to, you know, safe and reliable contraception. And then moving from there into the conversation about reproductive justice, which includes social welfare protections and, and other things. And um, so I, I see it all as, as complementary and really um, as the same work. Um, but I think you know, starting starting with a conversation about reproduction takes it in a somewhat different direction. And um, and I think I've been I think I've been sort of planning to write this book for a long time. Uh, we're planning to do something in this area for a long time, but the precipitating event was uh, my mother's death. Um, so my mom, um, my mom had a stroke uh, during a family event. We were all gathered together in, in synagogue for my nephew's bar mitzvah, and um, and in the first ten minutes or so, my mom had this um, this catastrophic medical event that she never woke up from. And it was right after that point that I started talking to my dad and my sister about the role my mother played in the deep criminalization of abortion in New York State. And, um, and, and I started learning very quickly about what a pivotal campaign that was on the road to Roe versus Wade and on the road to the you know, bigger decriminalization of abortion. Um, but I guess the reason that before, even before saying that, I mentioned, you know, the other work I've done on uh, uh, social welfare rights and that kind of thing, um, is because I also um, very quickly realized that I didn't want to write a book that was just about abortion, right? That I also wanted to include this dimension of what act activists today call reproductive justice. And at some point early on in imagining the book, I remembered that our next door neighbor for most of the 1980s, um, and we lived uh, on Western Avenue um, between 98th and 99th Street. And our next door neighbor was this amazing Puerto Rican physician named Helen Rodriguez Trias, um, who um, is one of the great unsung heroes, I think, of modern American women's history. And so with my mom, on the one hand, leading me into the story of the decriminalization of abortion and the struggle over that, and Helen, on the other hand, leading me into her story about Puerto Rican anti-imperialism and ultimately the fight against sterilization abuse, both on the island of Puerto Rico and on the U.S. mainland, especially New York. Right then, I could tell this much more robust story that was about um, both forks uh, of the movement and also about the tensions between them, based in um, race and class. And that was a story that I really wanted to tell and that I wanted to like have in the in the public conversation. Very cool. Yeah, I love um there's so many elements of the book that are distinctly New York, like couldn't happen in any other city. Um and I'd love to just like tease out those elements too, like what the thinking about neighbors, physical proximity, um, interclass, interracial contact. Um, and how that spurred organizing, how the blackout of 1977 was really crucial for the formation of some of these groups. Um, so Hopet, can you talk a little bit about the various activist groups that you profile in your story um, and maybe a significant win and challenge that each of them faced? Um, yeah, just first a word on New York. Like, um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And in some ways, it's very kind of intimate in a geographic way. Um, you know, there were there were meeting rooms at NYU that white radical feminists were in. You know, at one time in the afternoon or the evening, and then these much more interracial, um, you know, anti-sterilization groups would be there a couple hours later. You know, and they were sometimes working together, and a lot of not working together, right? And um, and the fact that my mother and Dr. Rodriguez Trias were next door neighbors and yet not allies, you know, and that was mostly a failure, I think, on my mother's side, um, that she, as a 
as an iconic Jewish middle class feminist didn't really get it about the agenda that um, Rodriguez Trias was pursuing that was informed by you know her background on the island of Puerto Rico and her sensitivity to the community of the South Bronx, which is where she was working. You know, um, I think it's just very it's it's resonant and it's really revealing of how we can be right um, close but not. Um, and how liberal white politics can can miss the boat sometimes. Uh, so that having been said, uh, yes, there were amazing successes. And so in my mom's case, um, she wrote the original draft of a law that did wind up decriminalizing abortion in New York. And sometimes we might think that New York is such a liberal place that was an easy lift. It was not at all an easy lift. The church was the fact the church was very very powerful. Many people thought that they were never going to achieve. Uh, a change in the abortion law that they would have to pass a constitutional amendment, a state constitutional amendment or a federal constitutional amendment in order to do that. Uh, and yet, because they organized the heck out of it, um, they were able to win in a matter of years between 1966 when Percy Sutton, uh, Black Assemblyman from Harlem, introduced the first bill until the spring of 1970 and finally won. So it was an astounding testament to organize, right? Um, they didn't win um, what my mom wanted was she was sort of representing the, the liberal feminist and radical feminist position, which was just take abortion out of the loop code, right? No regulation at all. That was the official position. Um, so they didn't win that, but what they won was still the most liberal abortion law in the country before Roe versus Wade. And that the key thing was no residency requirement. Right, so people came from every state in the U.S. literally to New York at the four row to have safe, legal abortions. So that's the that's their big win. On the other side, one of biggest trias and her her colleagues in SESA, uh, the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse, uh, they won a series of dramatic victories. First, in the Health and Hospitals Corporation, um, you know, in the whole public hospital network, to to dramatically increase the guidelines for sterilization for somebody who could be considered to have consented. Um, because what they saw was, you know, some people were literally being, um, being given sterilizations when they had no idea that that was happening to them. But in a much bigger number of cases, people were being forced or manipulated or encouraged, especially if they were Latinas or if they were or working class or poor Black people. Um, and and some, some unmarried, White people too <laughs> um, uh, were being kind of pushed into having sterilization. So they had these dramatically increased guidelines, first in the AKC and then um, citywide. Um, they won before the New York City Council. And then they joined with this um, organization that most of them also were part of, the Parasa, um, founded after the Hyde Amendment in 1977, the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against. Sterilization abuse, Harasa. Um, they joined with Harasa and they were able to win at the federal level too. And they got the federal Department of Education and Welfare to issue guidelines to all hospitals and all healthcare facilities in the US that dramatically increased those guidelines for sterilization. And those are still in effect, those guidelines. So that also is an astounding win and an astounding testament to the power of organizing. Um, so yes, thank you for each other. We're gonna have one more short clip from her, um, just to keep us on time. But I think so. There is there was a committee to end sterilization abuse. SESA, which was led by Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias from Lincoln Hospital, and she was put in power after the young lords occupied Lincoln Hospital and demanded community control of the facility. So that. Is that that's the clip I'm going to skip over just for time? Um, but that is a really interesting part of the story and how it's rooted in history we're talking about um, last session. Um, and a bit on the we'll make this full interview available after the session and up a lot. So watch it then. Um, but I think it's important. She talks a lot about these these really big, impressive wins um, from these two coalitions. So I just there's a four minute clip on. The tactics of organizing of this group. So, okay.
Yeah, well, there's a lot. Um, uh, I guess the first thing I would say is that this might seem unradical, but to me, it, it, it was very radical that they worked both in the streets and in the suites. Um, and in fact, it was it was some folks who were who were really old left or the new left who brought that um, that tactical understanding that that was essential. So um, uh, there was a woman who was um, who was in the bureaucracy of the Health and Hospitals Corporation, who had a who had a left background, an old left background. And she and Helen, um, and Helen was never a card carrying anything, I don't think. Um, but her first husband was, I'm sure, either a communist or a Trotskyist. And, you know, she had been running in left circles for a long time. Anyway, they had this insight that they that they could organize on the outside, you know, and and do militant action with people in the neighborhoods who needed and and were demanding better healthcare, community responsive healthcare, um, and at the same time that they could work on the inside and that they could get the Health and Hospitals Corporation itself to endorse new guidelines. And so they pursued both very, very actively and aggressively um, and unapologet unapologetically, like on both sides. Um, and if one of the elite doctors, you know, from inside the system accused them of being too activist or something, you know, they would say, well, you know, what do you what do you say to the community demands? Like how do you answer, how do you answer their complaints about the quality of healthcare services, the quality of the facilities that they're that they're forced to use in Lincoln or at Harlem Hospital or something. Um, and they never backed away from from doing both, you know, um, and from pursuing the kind of concrete, legal, bureaucratic Political changes that it was possible for them to pursue, even as they understood like that wasn't going to be enough, right? They were still um, they were still fighting for a better world. Helen was still fighting for Puerto Rican independence and autonomy, and, you know. Um, but uh, but they worked with them, uh, you know, a short or medium term time horizon in which they were they were you know seeking concrete change and willing to work. You know, uh, both inside and outside, and I think that was really important. They also, like in Seis and Caracas, uh, in particular, uh, they built this very strong interracial coalition that I think a lot of um, activists today in the feminist movement think wasn't possible in the seventies and eighties. There's some idea about like white feminism back back then. There was just white feminism, <laughs> and then later everybody got smart, like. Mm -hmm. There were white socialist feminists and Puerto Rican and Black socialist feminists um, who were working together, and there weren't a ton of them, but they were working together, and they created very, you know, robust coalitions, um, and they were able to defeat actually um, some of the white feminists. You know, when they when they were trying to control sterilization abuse, their big enemies were the folks in Planned Parenthood. Like literally, Planned Parenthood was it, it was the opposition and the National Organization for Women at the national level, the national headquarters was the opposition. Um, the New York City chapter now eventually got on board, but nationally um, now never did. And this kind of ragtag group, um, this interracial group of people with with different kinds of left commitments, a variety of left commitments, um, working with people in the communities, people in East Harlem and people in the South Bronx, um, people in Brooklyn, uh, right, they they won. They just won and won and won. Uh, and I think I think there's a lot to learn from that. Like they didn't have any doctor, any elite fancy, you know, white um, doctors in their coalition. They didn't have the Planned Parenthood people. Um, they weren't the you only, know, like, you know, inside the the halls of the Democratic Party or whatever. Um, but they just kept winning. Well, what, um, so um, this 
Felicia's book and my conversation with her was really interesting. I, I don't know if yeah, you Oh, yeah, okay, just out of curiosity. Um, Felicia had mentioned, had she written books before? And do you know what specific subjects those ones were about? Um, she said welfare reform. Um, okay. Yeah. Dr. Do you want to be more That's a private I get it. Yeah. Sure. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think the, that question I asked her about New York, I'm really interested in how like the the physical design and setup of our city is conducive to a unique politics. Um, and it's like this was her mom and her neighbor um pursuing really divergent paths of organizing and um agendas and they never unified forces and it ultimately under Karasa that was a unified organization fighting for both abortion and the end of sterilization abuse. Um this is a clip that I'm going to skip over but Karasa fell apart because of the lesbians um they <laughs> they showed up and they said we we want to challenge the, they they said that the, Lesbianism is a can challenge the idea of heterosexual reproduction as a framework um, to, to reconsider, to understand what reproduction is. Um, and the leadership, it just it caused a bitter divide over um, the priorities of the organization, um, leading to its um, dissolvement. So really interesting. And lots of other things happening in the 70s with queer liberation that we're not gonna touch on the discussion. Did she say to that parent that was the opposition? Yes. So in the fight for sterilization abuse um, and against coercive sterilization, um, the national organizations weren't on board with including that in their political platform. Um, and that I think also goes back to the roots of these organizations, Pengerhood, Narrow Pro Choice. Um, big feminist organizations had their roots in a eugenics movement and had like white racist leadership um, and espoused ideas of population control um, and things like that. And that's a really important history that we have to acknowledge and contend with in our movement today. So I think it's, it's really important that we discuss it. Um, and what coercive sterilization was affecting women of color. Um, and it was, it was the stemming from a white supremacist and anti-black racist um, perception of and I, I think what the family is who is deserving of parenthood. Um, that's where the practice comes from. And the national organizations, like she mentions now, um, were not on board with that fight. Um, and a lot of it had to do with like issues of prioritization, like what are they going to choose to fight for? Um, but and that's what happened to you with sexuality. They're just like sexuality is not on our agenda. So we're gonna let that be what brings us into this. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So I wanna um, um so the the reproductive justice conversation um in the 70s was this great victory, Roe v. Wade, um which guaranteed the constitutional right to abortion on the basis of privacy. Um, a number is formed by emanations from the Bill of Rights is the language of the opinion. Um, and no surprise, it was overturned last year, tragically. Um, but three years after Ruby Wade, um, the Hyde Amendment was passed, which prevents federal funds going to abortion. Um, and so the, the high Amendment largely prevented women of color and poor women from accessing abortion for the last 50 years. Um, and the Dobbs case last year and the overturn of Roe v. Wade was no surprise. Um, it, this has been the project of the right for 50 years. We have seen a really organized right take this issue up, trap laws, targeted regulations of abortion providers, closed the majority of available clinics um, in red states before Dobbs, um, 
we saw like regulations on waiting periods, fake abortion clinics. All of this led to jobs not being a surprising moment, but a tragic one nonetheless. Um, so that's where we are with abortion today. As Felicia mentioned, the guidelines on coercive sterilization are still in place at a national level. So that remains a really important victory of this organizing. Um, but the, the fight for abortion continues and we all have must commit our energy and time to it um, with these employing the tactics that we've learned from our um, feminist elders. Um, all right, we are now gonna look at other forms of labor, labor in the workplace. Um, thank you. Can I please interject something really quick? Yeah. As the resident, like single payer, like weirdo, uh, the Medicare for All explicitly repeals the Hyde Amendment and explicitly covers abortion. And I think some people may not know that. And it also now explicitly covers gender affirming care. So if you care about that stuff, support Medicare for All. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think there too, just about how this, like, the reproductive politics debate in the 70s we see this difference between like just abortion and then everything upstream of abortion and that's like the right to safe housing right to parent and dignified and safe environments and these are all things that as socialists we care a lot about so like the the right to housing being so important to for the ability to have a child um links up our socialist agenda with reproductive politics and women's liberation. Um, and we're gonna hopefully tie that all together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Okay, so as, as the title of the session goes, and as Alice just explained, so we're talking about socialist feminism in the 1970s, but also um, social women, working women in the labor movement. So before we probably gets a little bit deeper into a specific case study with a nine to five organization, I thought it would be good to characterize the labor movement and what we, just to give context to the world on the same page about what's happening in the 1970s in terms of labor organizing. So, and also just want to clarify the summary, definitely not all inclusive, um, but I just want to highlight some events that happened, some specific things that I think are interesting at the moment. So the working class uh, begin the working class beginning in the late 1960s uh, begins to reshape its relationship to power, both within unions with leadership and with authority at large, and, and in the tenor of its rebellion. This was a notable departure from the more recent post-war decades of relative obedience and alignment with union leadership. We start to see a departure in, in that relationship in the 1970s. It's interesting to consider who benefited from unions before this point in the 50s and 60s. People of color, service workers, farm workers, and of course, women were largely excluded. Union employer relationships were primarily to the advantage of core union members, skilled workers, and those who benefited from the World War II post-war boom. Union leadership filled an important, this, this one was really interesting to me during my, my readings. I wasn't aware of the relationship between union leadership um, and employers um, to this extent. But union leadership filled an important role for employers, keeping workers in line in exchange for rising wages and better benefits and ensuring uninterrupted production, production during periods of high profitability. These were, there were feelings of resentment over this new, more rebellious wave of radical labor organizers among union leaders who were often older white men, bureaucrats, and even gangsters. Some key quotes in our reading summarize the attitudes and ideas that union leaders shared in the recent decades leading up to the 1970s, and I thought those were kind of interesting to highlight. So this first one um, is a quote from George Meany, and from 1956, president of AFL-CIO for 24 years. I never went on strike in my life, never ordered anyone else to run a strike, never had anyone, anything to do with a picket line. There is not a great difference between the things I stand for and the things that NAM leaders stand for. I stand for the profit system. I believe in the profit system. I believe in free enterprise, and the free enterprise system completely. So this is not usually what we think about when we think about like leftist uh, union members, union leaders at the time and labor organizing, but this is just to uh, demonstrate the risks that's happening at this time. 
Um, and you go to the next slide, there's another little quote. Um, this is another one from Walter Ruther, president of the United Automobile Workers, um, complained, these, these, these hundreds of thousands of young workers, they don't know where they came from and they don't know where they're going. So they don't like it. <laughs> um, the New Deal system solutions to remedy tension between labor and capital favored the employers and were based on expanding on the expanding economy um, during post or during the post-war boom. The years of prosperity fueled by war and war crime production. This period came to an end in the late 1960s, bringing forward a crisis of profitability and employers' responses to it. The profitability of the war in Vietnam took a turn in the late 60s as well, becoming too expensive and increasing prices in the economy. As profitability wanes, employers began to push back against the working class, resisting wage and benefit demands, resisting organizing, and by cracking down on the speed of work and productivity on assembly lines. This is just the beginning of their strategy, of course, as we'll see by the end of the 1970s, um, the capitalist class will have its way regardless. Um, as many of us know, it's not truly possible for the capitalist class as a whole to be an ally to the working class as their interests are in conflict with one another. So this era, this era of collaboration that favored employers but still benefited workers um, was bound to hit a wall inevitably. Other factors during the 1970s that played into this dynamic um, included inflation increasing at the time and the OPEC uh, embargo on the United States for its role in resupplying the Israeli military during the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, which increased the cost of gasoline and things like this. Um, the shift from profitability to profit loss during a time of economic stress, and at one point a recession and a rise in unemployment, seems to be the tension point at which the working class of the 1970s becomes more rebellious. There are any questions so far? There's a lot of, there's a lot of talking, sorry. <laughs> um, there was a significant upsurge in strikes in the 1970s. The working class is extremely active. These included wildcat strikes, which were strikes that were not authorized by union leadership. And I think they were also illegal by federal law. Grievance strikes, sit down strikes, contract rejections, and contested union elections, often initiated by the rank and file. Many felt that unions themselves were not democratic and weren't representative of the will of the membership. So I think the next slide, uh, yeah, next slide. Um, yes. Okay, um, this quote from Gary Briner, president of the local union chapter in Ohio during a 1972 strike um, at the General Motors fossil plant sums up the constant frustration felt throughout the labor movement at this time. I consider democracy within the union to be the most important single issue. If the steel workers had been consulted, they never would have agreed to an international executive board, which excluded black, Latinos, and women. If the steel workers were consulted, they would insist on the right to vote on union contracts in the same manner other unions do. They rightfully feel they are not running their own affairs and are not being represented on the district level. I think I'm just pointing out all these differences because I think it's interesting to look at how even within the, the labor movement within unions, there's this tension and feeling that workers are not really in control, their interests are not being served the best, there's still like a, a bowing down to employers and capital happening. Um, strikes in the 1950s and 60s were considerably were considered relatively tame compared to the 1970s. They're described in some of our readings as routine affairs in which people went about their lives and simply didn't show up to work leaving trade union leaders to work on behalf of workers um, to settle disputes behind closed doors, which, yeah. Um, so the workers are not really settled. The workers are not really centered in the fight. There, there are people working on behalf of them, not according to their interests, and people are not really activated in the way that they become in the 1970s. Um, but this, this was a different day, and workers were organizing strikes and centering themselves in the struggle. And they were more than willing to disrupt capital more aggressively than their predecessors. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, that's not it's, okay. <laughs> wrong, wrong cue. Um, so I wanted to go through a few different uh, examples of strikes that were really especially disruptive in a way that you didn't see as much in the last the previous two decades, in the 50s and 60s, um, just to illustrate how willing people were to really fuck shit up, <laughs> like seriously. Um, so in 1971, there was a West Coast longshoremen strike. West Coast longshoremen <laughs> conducted the longest waterfront strike in U.S. history in 1971 in opposition to union to the union's leadership. The strike threatened the flow of military goods and personnel to the war in Vietnam. So Nixon in, invoked the anti-strike top friendly act injunction. So they were literally interrupting the flow of goods to continue the wartime effort. 
Um, I think to imagine people doing something like that, you know, it's just interesting and putting ourselves in these examples and thinking like, to, to what extent are, are we going or, or what, we, what we would be willing to do to disrupt capital. Um, so this illustrates how far the working class was willing to go and how disruptive they were willing to be in the system and in relationship with their own union leaders. The second example, which I believe is this one, um, yes. The truckers revolt. Um, and another display of workers' willingness to completely disrupt systems in a major way, truckers shut down highways in protest um, to the Nixon administration's energy policies. This happened during a time when political walkouts were being organized in response to gas prices, and when miners were demanding that the governor roll back the cost of fuel because commuting costs were becoming unbearable. So this quote I took from one of the readings, the truckers began shutting down the nation's highways, snarling traffic and disrupting the distribution of goods and services. With CB, citizens banned radios and handles to obscure their identities, they formed convoys and organized slowdowns and blockades. Thousands of tractor trailers jammed the turnpikes in Ohio and Pennsylvania. They choked off the New Jersey, the New York, Washington, DC corridor at the Delaware Bridge. So you can see this is really major disrupt, disruption in the system. First, you're interfering with war, and now you're going to shut down highways, um, and people are in support of, well, a lot of people are in support of them. Uh, the last quoted description uh, that I want to share with you guys of like an event that happens, um, a striking event, encapsulates how widespread working class solidarity was and shows the goodness of people to stand up for each other in the struggle against class exploitation. It's a longer one. There we go. Um, so four service employees, international union locals, representing hospital, clerical, maintenance, and social workers, rejected a wage offer from San Francisco Board of Supervisors and struck. They were joined by teachers who honored who honored picket lines set up at the schools. The municipal highway, sorry, <laughs> the municipal railways, mostly black motor men and conductors joined in, as did transit drivers. Farm workers going to substitute teachers to shut down school bus farms. Governor Ronald Reagan threatened to send in the National Guard, but the strike continued to spread. Only an early settlement by SEIU leaders prevented a much wider strike. In August 1974, everywhere you turn, wrote, wrote one reporter, someone is on strike. Airline mechanics, bus drivers, copper miners, sanitation workers, firemen, hospital workers, painters, steel workers, telephone workers. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees voted to shut down the state of Ohio. I don't know, I really, this kind of, again, demonstrates how, like, the solidarity here, too, just, like, one group after another joining each other in this massive um, strike, I think is just remarkable to think about, like, what that would even look like today. Uh, the upheaval and tension throughout the 70s opened the door for more radical action, challenges to power within and outside unions, and disruptive and illegal striking. This context, this context is helpful as we consider the ways working class women specifically fought for equity in the 70s and joined the labor movement. Now we're going to focus on one case study that Carly is going to go over into in organizing working class women through the nine to five organization, which brought women into the labor, women into labor organizing in the 1970s and brought working class women into the women's movement. But before we do that, I have some discussion questions. We have time for discussion questions, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, it's not bad. It's eight thirty, so if you have to go, yeah, you guys have free, to go. Um, but we we have a couple more pieces. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Uh, okay, so discussion questions. Um, considering the conditions of the working class in the 1970s that provoked increased rebellion and more disruptive striking, what are the conditions of today's labor climate that inspire collective action and labor organizing? And then the second follow-up question with that is, are there any differences in our conditions today that may inhibit this kind of active and disruptive organizing? Should we give people a couple minutes or do you just have like a wide open and everybody just put them together? Okay, let's just do it one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, at least as a public sector worker, I, I mean, it might be a damper, but I, I think it's just the conditions, the conditions are really bad. Um, I work in the parks department, we're seeing a ton of austerities, but honestly, uh, there, there's not much collective action at all right now. I think they're kind of like, I mean, the, the, um, Something that specifically happened in New York was that they banned all striking by public sector workers. And that's really, uh, yeah, it's called the Taylor Law. So you like, it's illegal to strike as a public sector worker oh. in New York. And that's 
destroyed our unions. I, I just think there's no militancy um, in the workplace. Um, the things that have really gotten us together are kind of uh, like immediate things about like, um, they're not really gonna make me work in this weather, that kind of stuff. And I think we have like, we're starting to um, build on things on, um, on the like broader social struggles that are happening. I think we've like been able to like do some collective action around like anti-racism and, and um, anti-transphobia stuff. Uh, but I think there's a lot less militancy than there was in the seventies. And also just a lot less like idea of even like what a union can be or what a union is. I think a lot of people see it at best as like a benefits source and um, it's just totally different from yeah, it's kind of interesting. Maybe this is an interview. I don't know if we'll get to it because we're so far, far over time or at time now. But the, it ends with me talking about how, like, we kind of snap back to like this capitalist, uh, you basically destroying labor power by the end of the 70s to like respond to this. So, yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, one thing I think is also like in this period, I, I remember talking to some you know, labor activist um, who was working in this period, and he was like, yeah, I mean, if I said, fuck you, my boss, and led, like, a walkout, and I got fired, I just, like, you know, got up out of bed, and then got a job at the next warehouse tomorrow, and I think for, you know, the question of, like, low unemployment and the availability of jobs and, like, making people more bold, I think shouldn't be um, uh, underestimated, and, you know, I think those of us who have done job applications now. It's like, oh, we send like hundreds of applications out, get zero responses. Like, and that was, it was just a very different world then. I do think, you know, it's interesting now we're in a period of somewhat low unemployment um, the last couple of years, and we are seeing like lots of inspiring labor like, action and Amazon and Starbucks and other places. And I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's why like left wingers care about low unemployment, both for like, you know, moral reasons, um, but also for like power reasons. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I this is a mixed one. I don't know where to place the president, but I guess in the context of, of your talk, I do think um, one thing about the seventies is that came on the heels of the sixties, and it just there were social movements popping off everywhere, and you know the. Civil rights movement inspired the anti-war movement, which inspired the women's rights movement, which inspired the labor movement. So I think that's an important context of all this. You know, I think that action in one sphere inspires action in another, and these things synthesize. We've seen some of that, and you know, and it's different and the same today. I know. I think you uh, yeah, I mean, so I'm from London. I don't think it's helpful. Um, but you know, obviously, went through a very similar moment, right? We had Thatcherism and Reaganism, right? And uh, I think a lot of the insights that come to us from the British land uh, applied quite neatly to the American land. And in particular, as I understand it, uh, an important part of what uh, of the answer to the question on the board is the role of the state and the role of legislation in consolidating class victories. So in Britain, you have the miners' strike, which is 84 to 85, right? So it's not the 70s, but it's kind of back in the back of the record 79, miners' strike 84, 85, right? Very, very militant class struggle that is violently smashed by a militarized state. They bust the police forces in all of the country, violently smash the miners' strikes. And then that victory, that physical violent victory of the capitalist state over the most militant section of the organized working class, is consolidated in the form of legislation that to this day, right, the 92 Act, makes it very, very difficult for workers in. Uh, England and Wales to go on strike. And I think that when the comrade here talks about laws that prevent public sector workers going on strike, that's a big part of the difference between the militancy and the 70s and now, is that now if you even try to go on strike, um, the legislative victories have been consolidated so comprehensively that, um, that it's difficult to even contemplate what it would mean. And, and I think that means we have to go back further than the 70s to think about where trade unions even came from. And there was a time when it was illegal, it was criminal, conspiracy to go on strike. And we have to broach the question of illegality, which is the question that relates to, you know, the Leninist party form. Like, we, we have to, within our arsenal tactics, we have to talk about illegal striking, we have to talk about uh, wildcat striking, if we're to put it up, because we need to, we need to win a victory on the same scale as the defeat that we suffered uh, under neoliberalism. And that victory comes firstly in the workplace, and then it is translated into uh, consolidation in some kind of um, state, the, the legislative consolidation, the new balance of class forces. That, that's my... Uh, uh, five packet and that's pretend. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, we when we're referencing nine to five, Karen Nisbaum. Yeah, that's her name. <laughs> Karen Nisbaum. She there's an interview and she literally ended up talking about um 
the, the ta one of the tactics that the capitalist class comes back with is consolidating the power of the economy and politics, as well as this new right that starts to come up over Nixon. So you're absolutely right that they've kind of overcorrected their problem to prevent this from ever happening again. Um, so yeah, one one more, or no, we are kind of low on time. No, okay, yeah. all right. We're gonna have a discussion yeah. briefly afterwards. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm just here for like an extra five minutes. Um, but yeah, ignore the slides that are you know. Um, so earlier in the section, I was mentioning the concept of conscious history and conscious history of like groups. Um, so where women can meet and collectively analyze their personal lives. One group practicing this was called Red and Roses Wake in Boston. Um, this was a socialist women's liberation collective made up primarily of like college educated middle class white women, um, a lot of these groups at the time. But also it was founded by Meredith Tax and Lyndon Gordon, Linda Gordon, uh, who was the author of one of our main readings. Um, but another notable figure here is the one that actually I already spoiled for you all, Karen Nussbaum. Um, she was a child of activist parents, dropped out of college to do anti-war organizing in Boston. While in Boston, she got a job as a clerical worker at Harvard, and then immediately was just struck with the injustices experienced by her and her co-workers. So at this time, clerical work, things like being a secretary, office administrating, um, it was a field highly dominated by women, and I believe still is, but don't quote me on that. Um, and thus, as you can imagine, was a field that was highly unorganized and disregarded as an agent of change within the labor movement. Um, so like even, you know, even though the Equal Pay Act had passed already, um, that doesn't stop uh, industries from underpaying industries dominated by women, things like that. Um, but all this dialogue between Nussbaum, uh, members of Brunick Roses, and other clerical workers came together to form the organization 9 to 5, the National Org Association of Working Women. Uh, also, yes, the Dolly Parton song is related to this org. <laughs> I see nodding. Good. Um, so 9 to 5 began in 1972 as an advocacy group for working women. They provided advice and guidance for women navigating the workplace, trying to get their pay, their working rights, um, as well as just dealing with the sexism that was pervasive in the office. Um, they helped with filing class action lawsuits to win back pay for women, um, getting legislative gains. Uh, it grew nationally and still exists today as an organization. Um, Today, it primarily focuses on advocacy and help for um, working women of color across the US. Um, but yeah, as part of this, uh, members of 9 to 5, especially Karen Osbaum, did a lot of workplace organizing as well. Um, let's see. And then eventually in 1975, which actually isn't too far from the beginning, um, uh, the 95 group in Boston formed into the local 925 of the SEIU, which gave these working women and clerical workers collective bargaining rights. Um, yeah, that's kind of basically the, the gist, but all in all, like seeing this organization form, one that still has power today, though not as much given the nature of our current conditions. Um, it's a great example of how we can recognize the gaps and organizing opportunities to build the power of the working class using this insight from specific identities and specific lived experiences who are otherwise maybe not noticed. Um, it's an impressive like, combination of the feminist-specific analysis tactics, the tactics of like, sitting in um, a group discussing your like personal lives to then realize political connections, um, as well as the, the power and organizing tactics of the traditional labor movement. Um, also, at this time, I'm just going to say because I want to mention 
uh, labor movement feminism at large is also just a concept. Um, I would almost place Karen as well in that realm. Uh, but this is very much like the intersection of socialist ideology with uh, labor movement and work. Um, yeah, and then finally, this comes brings to mind the concept of using labor for social change. Even the spawn said, like, it never occurred to me that unions were a force for social change. Using um, this labor power to win, yes, like material gains for specific work working women, but also shifting the scale on a larger cultural sense. Um, yeah, so maybe we could just sit on that point for a bit. Um, think about the power of labor that can be used for social battles. Uh, I don't actually have a specific question, but if anyone has thoughts in regards to this, additional examples, thoughts for right now, that would also be great. So that's what's the song relation? Nine five. Uh, no, I know. But okay. I, um, so there was a um, a film was made, the film Nine to Five. Um, so. Karen Nussbaum and a few other clerical workers like from the Boston from the time uh, did interviews with the makers of the film to inform the plot of it. And then that song was for the movie. I actually should have been the song. So <laughs> okay, we gotta move into our final discussion. <laughs> but uh, I think these all come together. Anyway, thanks. Um, we're gonna advance through the next couple of slides. Okay, yeah, let's go back. Okay, um, we're gonna end here with one last quote. I know we've had a lot of <laughs> here in this one. This one's a kicker. Um, but we're we're hoping to open up to discussion. And please, if you need to leave, leave. Um, I know we are a little bit over time. Um, but you guys are all brilliant people, so we also love to hear um what you guys think. Okay, so um, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time uh, from Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment. And I, I kind of, I, I, I introduced it for the socialist summer's obsession, but also for our movement as a whole for um, uh, political theory and analysis of our world. Okay, here it goes. The instruments of power, language, weapons, and finally machines which are intended to hold everyone in their grasp, must in turn be grasped by everyone. In this way, the moment of rationality and domination also asserts itself as something different from it. The thing like quality of the means, which makes the means universally available, itself implies a criticism of the domination from which it has arisen. And if we think about this in the context of women and feminism, we think again back to that elemental unit of politics all our women are contained in these elements of domination and oppression which means that it reaches and affects all of these women which leads to the consciousness raising groups which leads to labor organizing um so we can map these marxist analyses onto um feminism and then think about what what other forms of domination are so pervasive that is when we start to recognize them and repossess them that's when we have power and that's when we can fight back um so next slide please last slide what what can we learn from this and where are we today and thoughts and reflections on the session floor is open <laughs> Um, you know, I was thinking of the principles factor in 1970. It was well kept, spontaneous, illegal, and it happened that it was Nixon backed out. He initially brought in the National Guard to deliver the mail, but then the postal workers won. Um, and in governance of uh, the late 60s, early 70s, just didn't give a shit about norms mm -hmm. and good behavior. And I don't know, there's something like about the 70s. You know, it's a cliche that the 70s were when the 60s hit the working class. But uh, the, um, that, that attitude uh, that we just don't give a shit about norms and we're going to strike or we're going to like raise our consciousness and do things, occupy magazine editors' offices, and you know, all the kinds of things that 
probably with us would be dead. Um, yeah, just, there's, that, that spirit seems so gone. And I think 40 years of neoliberalism has so penetrated the common sense of everyone, working class, you know, the professional class, everyone. It's just so, um, maybe it's slipping a bit, but there's still this like whole of uh, orthodoxy and good behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, over consciousness that just didn't exist there. I don't know whether it's the end of a long prosperity, the golden age that brought about uh, such as misbehavior, just a broad social rebellion that was going on, but you know that just we don't give a shit attitude in this precious and needs to be yeah. captured. And we frame much of this semester around revolution, counter revolution, or like reaction. On a reaction, and I think like neoliberalism and just like the homogeneity, and like it, it has it's really clear our roles in this world now because, and that has been like a really targeted project of neoliberalism, and that makes radical organizing a lot more challenging and, and seeing spontaneous activities of radical organizing a lot less likely. Yeah. Um... So uh, I have just a slightly different take on, on the situation of the 70s. I, I feel like um, the majority was still conservative. You know, the George Meany, I think George Meany was still the head of the AFL-CIO, uh, you know, at that point. And, um, you know, the old men ran the, ran the unions. And, but at the same time, there were people from that had gone to Vietnam that had, you know, that had, there were these shoots. Now they weren't organized, but they were there. You know, so when actions happen, things change. Now I think it's different now. I think that the uh, old men have all died off in the, in the union movement. And there were struggles from the bottom um, and the top, of the union movement is much more progressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was only the District 65 and SEIU who would show up at anti war movements and, you know, and they had their banners and colors and, you know, they were there. There was that element, but it was only a little element. But now I think it's much broader, you know, but of course people sell, you know, when you have power, you sell out. So there are sellouts. But I think you find that the, um, union movement is much more open now. Like I think this uh, uh, UPS strike, if it happens, is going to be, you know, pretty uh, a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, has 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 real real potential. But but also the pre in the present, young people, while not as I don't give a shit as you're talking about, or fuck it, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, white skin privilege was an idea I don't know, 30 or 40 people had. Now everybody understands that. You know what I mean? There's some ideas that are much, much more uh, universally held amongst mm -hmm. young people. You know, so it's a very different situation. It has pluses and it has minuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking. I mean, I was thinking this is like the inverse of what we learned from the organizing of the 70s because it's interesting. I think a lot of what you all presented today is the organizing of the left. What was also happening, as you were saying, Alice, is like the organizing of the right, and you know, for a counter reaction. And and I think you were the one who put it that it's like it was like a fifty-year project to like overturn Roe v. Wade. And it, it does make me think a lot about the importance. You know, when we think about like the importance of building institutions that last and that can build a project over time. And obviously it's like easier for like megalomaniacal right-wingers because they have like an infinite money spout. Um, but like, you know, you also, I think, mentioned the way that um, the, uh, was it the Chicago Women's um, Liberation Union? Yeah, it fell apart because of horizontal, like a kind of lack of commitment to certain kinds of organizational norms. You know, Joe Freeman's great essay from the period, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, I think That's is it. worth reading. So I think it's like, you know, I, I think it's, I, I think a lesson I learned in that period is to draw a lot of like power and inspiration from the organizing that made changes, but also to think about 
how we create organizations and the two things that mm -hmm. can last the test of time and do really big projects mm -hmm. like you know <laughs> undo what the right wing just did over the last 50 years. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say if there are any women or not men here who would like to give a thought, that would be super cool. Um, <laughs> considering we're here at the, the women presentation. Um, but also, yeah, no, my, my final thought, my takeaway is we need a mass organization of women and everyone who is affected by sex-based oppression. Um, to organize for material rights and gains. Um, I don't know, I would like to see more specific socialist feminists organizing, which I believe might be a lead into announcements. But... Huh. Any final thoughts before we wrap? Another cis out white ministry, but uh, uh, I just want to say that, like, just a couple weeks ago from this very office, we provided a massive uh, labor support and mutual aid through distributing thousands of masks. I only came to drop off masks, but I like to immediately notice it was mostly women in the office. So like there's that reproductive labor again. Yeah. But like that is one of the things that um, uh, is maybe different about the movement today is that there is a resurgence of uh, unionizations and strikes and like the federal strikes. But I think DSA does have a strong role in being able to connect all of those. So it's not just Amazon striking for Amazon and Starbucks striking for Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera. But it's us being able to connect people that maybe aren't even in those unions, let alone, or aren't even in unions, let alone those unions are coming out to support. So I think that is one way that there's been like some sort of cultural shift. Yeah. But I just did want to say that like, you know, we actually did do support here. And it's from what I saw mostly women that like got that together, like they split it and like made it happen. So. We are going to close here. Um, I hope you all learned something today. And if you are interested in learning more about EPFSA, getting involved, you're going to have announcements from. Uh, do you want me or what, do you want to just get them? I actually didn't. <laughs> I can if you want. Sure. Um, we'll just do it from the back here, though. Uh, hi, comrades. Um, so, a few announcements. First, let's give another round of applause. I'm Jeremy Gehan, not a heterosexual so man. Thank you. Um, but uh, uh, and uh, I'm director of MSC DSA. Um, just a few announcements for stuff coming up. Um, we in political education have uh, one more session of the Socialists of America, which is here in this office in one week, um, which will feature um, uh, Doug Henwood um, here in the back to talk about what it was like to be a socialist in uh, kind of the neoliberal left. Um, in the 90s, the dreary days of the left. Um, uh, we'll have Jamie Peck to talk about some of the kind of period of movements that have been arising. And we'll have um, author Raina Lipsitz, who wrote a recent book on kind of the recent rise of us, um, <laughs> sort of the, the new, new left, um, uh, the Bernie moment, and kind of where that might be headed. So it should be a great discussion. We're planning maybe some barbecue and chilling out. Um, yeah, Karen, do you want to say? Oh, yeah. So we were going to try out um, uh, for Polyad's first time to do a barbecue before um, the session. So starting at 6, this is something we have not done before. We don't know how to go, but we thought it would be nice. You know, people are coming from work sometimes, and you're probably, like, starving by 9 o'clock, or you're you know, grabbing a bagel or something on the way here. So we hope um, to try this out as, as something we can do. So That's everyone is invited. Please, please um, you know, join us and bring... And then um, second thing I'll say, oh, can we go back to that slide though? Don't, don't leave that slide yet. But um, second thing, first, because Lee's pointing to it, um, we're going to pass the helmet, um, pass the helmet here, um, which is, you know, the space cost money. We talked about building institutions, NYCDSA, um, nothing is free in New York City. Um, so to have an office, to have events, um, we all have to get it in. So we're going to put Jumbo up in a minute. Minute, you can get that too. But if you have some cash, please put it in the helmet. Yeah. Um, third thing is on the slide. We have a seminar coming up. A new, another new Polyad um, innovation with labor histor or historian Steve Fraser, um, who has written among other things on uh, Great Book on Wall Street, the history of Wall Street, 
and has written a fair, uh, fairly great deal on the history of labor, is doing a seminar um, series on the labor question in American history, a broad overview of um, labor history and kind of the role the labor question has played in the development of American society and politics. So kind of um, a good, I think, follow-up from this course. Um, our plan is a little more seminar style. So please check that out. It's with a great historian who uh, is like, I want to teach for NYCDSN, which is pretty cool. Um, and it is uh, free. Um, last slide, if there is a last one. Is there anything else on there, Jesse? That's all we got. Yeah. Great. Um, if you do have a Venmo, if you didn't have cash, um, you can see Carrington, who's the Pollyette treasurer. He can uh, take your contributions. Um, and the last thing is, if you're not an NYCDSA member, please join to build these institutions on the left, fighting for social feminism and for the rights of all working people, dsausa.org slash join. Also, if you want to join, please uh, yeah. Yeah, that is also an option, um, and you can talk to any of us that were on the screen. Um, we're gonna pick up our chairs. Um, please stack them on the side, and it's one last round of applause for our speaker. <laughs> Thank you.